I was already here when Elliot arrived. And then, Elliot, you had very black hair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I see with some alarm thinking <laughs> how I must I know, I can not have dark hair. hair. <laughs> Elliot helped us to conceive an important course on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And he's been a marvelous colleague since, and I've learned a great deal. So. When I speak, I normally hear what I rather pretentiously call rubrics. These are red letter headings, if you will, in medieval manuscripts, as you will know. And they're intended, these short phrases, to give you something of the logical spine of what I wish to say, so that you'll know where I am in what's to come. And then the headings are very frequently implied invitations to you, after I've finished, to return to those and think about them yourselves and relate them to your ongoing understanding of Himalayri. So the ones which I will choose for tonight are relatively short. Very frequently, the phrases I use will be ones from the author himself or herself. Uh, the ones tonight are a mixture simply of subject declaration and then of phrases from lady. So the first is why communicate? Why communicate? The second is how to communicate. How to communicate. The third is the Canto of Ulysses. It's a chapter as you have seen in the survival in Auschwitz. I will be calling that text tonight in English if this is a man. In Italian, he gave it the title, Sequestri Uomo, if this is a man. It is a title which is resonant, and I'll talk about that Italian title and the English version of it presently. It is one of the most complexly challenging chapters in all of Prima Lady's work, mm -hmm. and I'd like to spend a little time on it with you, because I think it of prime importance. Number four. I was broken. I was broken. And then number five. Next year. Next year. Let me go to the first. Why? For this, I want to note that I met Prima Levi at a particular point in my life. You will be meeting Prima Levi at particular times in your life. And the coming to Prima Levi, as with all of those whom we study, with the professors we meet, with one another, is a form of encounter, personal encounter, through texts, personal encounter. Premillennium in one of his poems, the one addressed to his friends, to my friends, is his title, says that we meet each of us on the way and are each of us marked with each. We receive the stamp, mm -hmm. if you will, of that meeting with the other person. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to invite you now to an understanding of what we do at this university is, mm -hmm. is precisely meeting and encountering others. Do you, do you follow that education is not an alienated thing where one is doing something in order to achieve grades, in order mm -hmm. writing papers, in order to fulfill requirements, that what is represented is, is really very complex and I hope intimate form of encounter. In this case, between Primo Levi and you. And I can't pretend that I'm not there. I don't want to. I'm, I'm there with you 
talking about Primo Levi, mm -hmm. but the real point is Primo Levi and your encounter with him. So in a way which is unusual for me when I'm speaking, I'll talk with you for a few moments about my first encounters with Primo Levi and what that's meant to me and why I am so very honored to be here tonight. And I mean that. Deeply, deeply grateful to have the chance to talk with you about Primo Levi. Right. As you will, I hope, in your generation in time, find Primo Levi's mark on you, the mark of that encounter deep enough that you will want to speak with him of other people about how you, in your own time, came to him. Right. I was born in Canada, in London, in Ontario, mm -hmm. in 1941. Therefore, 71 years old. I, I can see quick math. <laughs> <laughs> and my education was what, to change cultural context, might be reasonably called Mandarin. Mm -hmm. That is, we were, it was a classical education. Lots and lots and lots of literature, lots and lots and lots of history, uh, Latin, Latin language, Latin literature. We were to write in Latin at times. We'd have our style in Latin criticized. Loads of French, obviously. Uh, some physics, some chemistry, but very much a classical education. And in that classical education, I was taught that there was a deep connection between the word human and humane. That all things being equal, humans would be humane with one another. And that because we are kind of one kind, all things being equal, we would be kindly one another. And the notion that education would conduce to our living that way. When I was a lad, all during my schooling, all during my time in Canada as a youth, I didn't hear a word about the show. Not a word. When I came to the United States to undergraduate school, I largely didn't hear about it either. This in the early 1960s. Not a word. And then in the later 60s and then early 70s, when I came to the University of Michigan, I, I started to hear what, to me, one couldn't construe about these events. And they seemed to me, as I came to hear more and more, to contravene everything I'd been taught about what we humans are. And it was devastating. Because humans were not humane toward one another. Kind was not kindly. And I tried to understand. And as progressively I knew more and more, I, I want to make a confession about myself in, in this. I simply some silly to I couldn't bear it. You know, and who am I? Right? Ralph Williams, Canadian, Goy background. <laughs> Who am I? You know, I've had my own pain in life, but I haven't suffered as those who went through the show suffered. Right? And yet I wanted to understand. And as I came to know more and more, it came to be sort of a black hole, if you will, that, that could suck everything I am into it. Oh, it's a, a sort of anti-world. 
What if that's the real world? These events happen. Who are we humans? We're saved. And so something you'll find out about me if I be honest getting to know you through it. Uh, I love history. Okay. <laughs> I've at this point been there sometime part of every year to me two or three for the last forty years. Right? I just love history. You know, you're born in a certain place, aren't you? I've been asking about your birthplaces. And that's necessarily necessarily home. But if you get lucky, I'm very fortunate. You, you find a home in the spirit where the air is right and the landscape is right and the people seem wonderful and and art is right and the architecture is right and the hills are just so wonderful. And for me for years that was, was Italy. And so, as I became acquainted, I started to study the Italian case for the show. And I thought, this will be good for me because it is a relatively restricted case. I just can't bear it. Well, I can't take it in. I just cannot take it in. In some particulars, like Auschwitz itself as a place and what happened there, right? And details of the whole, but details too. And so I thought, well, if I study the Italian case, it's at least a limited case in terms of the larger European situation, right? And I'll care terribly, because I didn't want to let myself off the hook. And I care terribly because in Florence, for example, which is the place I know best, I know the synagogue. I know the places in the synagogue where the people sat. The bullet marks are still there in the synagogue from the war. The Germans used it as a garage during the war. I'm aware of the families, where their business is, who they are what happened during the show, right? You got it. And so I thought, well, do you, do you, Paul, perhaps I could do a balance, perhaps I could take something in to come to understand something while not letting myself off easy. And so I began to study. And I came aware of the works of Primo Levi. Mm -hmm. And do you know how it is that you, you meet Lots of people, don't you? Thousands of them here in Michigan. But every once in a while, when you meet someone, you say, hello, there's someone home in there. Do you, do you know, there, there, there is depth, right? That with which you resonate, okay? There are depths in all of you, but with which you particularly resonate. And then you read authors, and somehow they speak to your mind emotions and understanding. And they become companions to it. And for me, that's been Primo Levi. Right? And so I read and read Primo Levi. And I wanted to get to know it. And I'm now talking the early to mid-1980s. And I was waiting until my Italian was better. I wanted it to be really good when I met Primo Levi. He read, he read English, but didn't speak it that well. And so I waited, and I arrived in Italy one spring in 1987. And the morning after I arrived, picked up the newspaper, and Primo Levi was dead. He had committed suicide is virtually certain the day before. And just a message from me to you. If there's something you really, really, really want to do, don't let worries about your fitness for it stand in your way of doing it. All right? Go with who you are, because the situation may not recur. So I never managed to speak with Primo Levi because I 
would like to have done. And then I read, read, read his works continually. And then I was associate chair of the English department in, in the early 1990s. And I wanted to speak about Primo Leo for reasons I'll mention in a moment. And I had no time in my course schedule. I was associate chair, undergraduate chair combined. I was, I was teaching a full load hmm. and doing lots of else. But I was the one who assigned courses. Mm -hmm. So I assigned myself a course in Primo mm -hmm. a one credit hour course, which I did on top of my schedule. And I began to speak. Mm -hmm. And the reason, essentially, is this is why I communicate for me, is that I'm 71. For me, the Shoah is the central disaster of the disaster century. Some fine things have happened, but by and large, I'm not proud of my century. You know, the First World War, the huge shocks afterwards, the horrors in this country and around the world of the Depression, the Second World War, the Shoah, the create on the Korean War, the Vietnam War, disasters in Cambodia, disasters in Africa, disasters in Egypt, disasters, disasters, disasters. You know. Your century hasn't begun very well either, <laughs> frankly. Mm -hmm. And I know that. Your meeting with Primo Levi will come within what probably are your earliest memories of international news. Do you remember 9-11, the news of 9-11, any of you? It may be there as part of your early consciousness. Mm -hmm. Your meeting with Levy comes then, and in the midst of wars, rumors of wars, mm -hmm. that are around us now, disasters spread across the globe. And so I want to talk with you both about Primo Levi and his attempt to understand those events and to communicate forward to you in terms of a world which you two are going to face. Right. And so it, for me, it's, that's the why of communication. I want to, in this sense, have Primo Levi with you and be there with Primo Levi as you face, as you remember the past, and face your own century, try to deal with it. There is, in this thing, a sort of moral responsibility. Uh, take out the sheets, if you will. I'm going to be referring to five or six of Friedman's poems. And Turn to the one called In the Beginning. It's on the third of the sheets. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. I don't know how much you know yet of, of the biography of Primo Levi. He was born in Torino in 1919. Curate, Torino, up north. Uh, he was of Sephardic family. The family had been expelled from Spain uh, by the Catholic monarchs, right, Ferdinand and Isabella, in 1498, right? And they had made their way across southern France and had landed in Piedmont. And his family stayed on there. There's a wonderful chapter on his family in Piedmont in the beginning of this book called The Periodic Table. And he belonged to a community, a Jewish community in Torino, which was largely assimilated. Not in the sense of having forgotten that they were Jewish, but one in which they were profoundly aware of being Italian. Right? And their Jewishness was, in the words of one historian, looked upon as nothing more than a social eccentricity. It was fine. They were Jewish, they were Italians, they were Italians, they were Italians. And in fact, 
of the peoples in Italy, which make up the ethnic mix, which is Italy, Jews have the claim to having been there longer than any other group. Some families were there. But Jews were there at the time of Julius Caesar. And it's a continuous Jewish community since then. Part of the horror for Jews, I don't know if any of you has read a book called The, the Garden of Fiji Fontini. Anyone heard of it? There's, there's a film on it too. You might want to, you want to see that, read the book at one time. There's an enormously touching passage in which the Jews of Ferrara, for that's the city, were being rounded up to be taken to the camps beyond the Alps. And a father says to a friend nearby, let's at least hope that they allow us to stay together. We of Ferrara. And the poignancy of that, I can see by your eyes, you realize we're Italians. We're Ferraris. That's who we are. Why are we being expelled? Do you, do you follow? It's, it's incomprehensible. The trains which were set up to unify the state are being used in the cattle cars to eject us from the state. What is, what is this? Do you, do you follow the sort of incomprehension really as to, to what was happening? The Jewish community in Torino was a brilliant one. The ladies whom I'm going to mention are not nearly related, but Carlo Levi was a famous painter and writer. Uh, Christ Stock and Abel, is a book that you might want to read. Uh, Rita Montalcini Levi, he just died. Uh, he did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was a Nobel laureate in physics. All right. Brilliant. Prima Levi was, from his youth, an atheist. He was a materialist. He was asked, uh, he said that he knew he was Jewish, he did a bar mitzvah. His house was just around the corner from the synagogue. But he was not a theist. He said he became aware of himself as a Jew in a certain way out of the experience of Auschwitz. Out of being told you are a Jew in a sense which was obviously incomprehensible and unacceptable, obvious. Right? He was asked later in life, do you believe in God? And he said, no, I do not believe in God. I think on God and I remember Auschwitz. And I do not see how the two can go together. I am thinking. I do not see. Enormously proud of being a Jew after Auschwitz, he studied Hebrew and Aramaic in order to, to study Torah and to study the Talmud. Enormously proud of the history of his people and an atheist. I was once giving a talk on Primo Levi, not at the university, and there was a woman who came to me after the first of the lectures I gave and said, I do not understand her. Her English was very halting. She was from the then Soviet Union, Russia, that's part. And she said, I do not understand. You said Primo Levi is a Jew and an atheist. I said, yes. She said, that is impossible. And I said, this was true of it. And a woman standing by our side said, I'm a Jew. I'm an atheist. And the woman looked at her and she said, I have never heard of that. I do not understand. <laughs> she said, no one that I know in Russia can say that, does say that. Okay. So proudly a Jew, an atheist, but that youthful atheism from his youth, deeply, deeply, deeply inflected by the experience of Auschwitz. I don't know whether in this course I think you're going to be reading Elie Wiesel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Will you? Right, yes. Yeah. Right. Elie Wiesel and Primo Levi are two indispensable 
voices of witness to the show. Right? Uh, we will be the first to create works of witness. Ilya right? Sell is angry at God, as you find, profoundly angry at God. He believes. Primo Levi is not angry at God. He tries to understand how we as humans came to be that, what we did to one another during that. That's the significance of the title of that first book of his in Italian, If This Is a Man. He sees the show, though it pivoted on the disaster to the Jews, not as alone a Jewish disaster. He sees it as a true disaster. And the fact and the meaning of the Shoah is for him events and issues to which we must And so the question, why communicate, is for Primo Levi twofold. He could not not speak of it. He said that for him, as for other, some of the other survivors, the need to speak of it was as elemental as the need of, for food, elemental as hunger. Others whom I know, and one or two of you have mentioned that you had family who had been in the show. Others managed to survive by not speaking of it. They simply cannot go on if they make an attempt to recall and communicate of it. And neither Primo Levi, who has the moral standing to speak of it, or certainly I have, have any criticism on them. Uh, the silence is for some a necessity. The pain is so great. The pain in so many ways. Sometimes I've had a student who said that my grandma and grandpa, who's usually grandparents at this point, have never spoken of it, never. But I've gone home and I've forgotten one of Primo Levi's books on the coffee table. And I've come home and Grandpa will say, I read that book you forgot at home. You know, his experience was kind of like mine. Let me tell you about it. And so they found a way of what I call triangulating, and it's like two Primo Levi moving through a second rather than facing me, telling alone, directly, at first. So why communicate? Because for Primo Levi it was, it was a necessity for him. And then secondly, a moral responsibility. Primo Levi was asked later, could this happen again? And the answer he gave, in this interview was, oh yes, to someone, to some group, all that's necessary is not to listen, not to ask questions, not to speak. You know what it means. And we'll talk about the difficulties of communication about Auschwitz in a moment. But the challenges to communication are, are very, very great. And as we'll see, look, let's take an example of him. Let's take a story told in another book and the late ones known to him, and then stories from him. 
the one from outside Lake. There's a town in the north of Italy. Well, Italy was still a safe refuge, or they thought a safe refuge, or a shaper refuge for other European troops. A Greek family, grandma, grandpa, mother, father, children, came to that town, refugees from Greece. They stayed in a hotel. They've been well-to-do people. Shortly thereafter, the SS came for them, after the SS had taken over the Jewish question in Israel. They took away the father and mother. They came next to take away the children. And they heard the grandparents pleading for the children. They took away the grandparents. The next day, their belongings were sold in the public square. And I can see by your eyes you know the real horror of the story. There were people there to buy them. They didn't ask what happened to those people. Where have they gone? They didn't know. They were just buying clothes. Do you follow? The apartment next door or down the street, which Professor so-and-so and his wife, or whatever the recent profession lived. That's a lovely apartment. You kind of wanted that. Suddenly the SS came and took them away, or someone took them away in the middle of the night. Their apartment's now available. Do you rent it? Do you ask what's available to them? The Jewish professor disappears from the university. Right? His post you always wanted. It's a prestigious post with more money. Do you ask what happened to it? Do you apply for the job, which is now open? All that's necessary is not to ask questions of your government. What's it doing? What does this mean? Look, I'm going to bring this whole one with me. And I'm a Canadian, and I suppose Canadians are not supposed to be politicians. But, you know, here it comes. You know what went on in the blood tunnel. Mm -hmm. And you know what went on in Abu Ghraib. Mm -hmm. Maybe not all. Maybe you want to know. Is your parents or you ask questions of the government? Why are people being washboarded? Why the electric shocks? What's going on? Why torture? Do you follow what I mean? All that's necessary is not to ask questions. Not to speak. If someone had told me, I'm not going to go on about this, but if someone had told me in the late 1990s that within a decade it would be government policy that the military would torture, I'd say, no, no, this is America. America doesn't do those sorts of things. And it happened, and we did it. And they did it in your name, by the way. Mm -hmm. right. Do you get your ball up? The danger in our own generations of not asking questions and then of not speaking about it. And, as we say, not listening. They're very great. One bar to communication. Listen to what a Primo Levi's poem is called The Survivor, the one I sing them to you now. He begins with an Italian translation. It's, it's strange. The words at the beginning of this poem in the Italian version are in English. Ah. So they need to put it in Italian in the English translation, if you follow, to oh, indicate yes. to you a shift of language. Wow. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, Doburi allora, at ora in cerca. It's a quotation the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Hmm. Since then, at an uncertain hour. Has anyone read the, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, Coleridge? It is the ancient mariner, and he's top of one in the tree. Now let a long gray beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stoppest thou thee? Someone's had an experience. He needs to tell about it. Since then, at an uncertain hour, 
that agony returns. And still my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. Once more, he sees his companion's faces, livid in the first faint light, gray with cement dust, nebulous in the mist, tinged with death in their uneasy sleep. At night, under the heavy burden of their dreams, their jaws move, chewing a non-existent turnip. Stand back. Leave me alone, submerged people. No way. I haven't dispossessed anyone. Haven't usurped anyone's bread. No one died in my place. No one. Go back into your midst. It's not my fault if I live and breathe, eat, drink, sleep, and put on clothes. Survivor guilt, as it came to be called. Because you have survived and others didn't. There were those who saved their lives by stealing someone's bread. There were those who let others go to their death. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. It's not my fault if I eat and drink and sleep and put, if I survived. Do you follow? You'll, you'll study survivor guilt. Mm -hmm. I'm Try to understand it, but you know that last line? It's from Dante. Mm -hmm. It is from the inferno, hell. Mm -hmm. And it's the line of a soul which is dropped out of the human body, and the human body is still alive and up here and moving. But the soul's in hell. You follow? Mm -hmm. That's the feeling that's being communicated here. How do you talk about it? And how can people come to listen? There are more complications to that. But to give you an example. Right? Number two is how to communicate. We'll be moving more quickly now. How do you communicate about it? Those who were taken, Levy decided, Levy was able to take his degree at the university because the Mussolini's racial laws in 1938 had declared that Jews could not take university degrees. They couldn't, be, uh, they couldn't go to study in libraries. They couldn't belong to clubs. Gentiles couldn't, Jewish uh, people couldn't have a Gentile he got his degree because an anti-fascist university professor gave him a research project at risk of his own career and Prima Levi graduated from the cum laude. By that time, the racial situation in Italy had gotten to be such that there were magazine articles called Defense of the Race in which it was declared that Jews were subhuman, subhuman intelligence, not a Primo Levi was deeply proud of being the top of his class, and living disproved of it. And one thing that you need to know about Primo Levi, he had as close to total recall as any mind with which I've ever been in contact. And it's important to realize about him, he not only did not forget, he could not forget. Every detail of the experience. And I don't know how he did it. To me, it's one of the great human efforts. And not only could he not forget, but he worked it over. He worked it over. He worked it over. He wrote and wrote in an attempt to communicate to us about the events and their meaning. As I, said, I think it's one of the great human efforts of any time. And if, and I think it's certain virtually that he did, he committed suicide 40 years later. The causes, I think, are complex. I'd be glad to speak with you on them sometime. But I, the question is not, might one have committed suicide? 
with his flawless memory in which he could not forget. The wonder is not that he committed suicide insofar as it was related to Auschwitz. The wonder is that he survived that fall and then worked it over and worked it over. I don't know about you, you're, you're, you're very young and maybe, maybe you haven't yet, but you know, there are memories in which just one's body tenses up. You know, even within our own lives. You, you follow what I mean? You just, at the memory of that. And think of the memory of Auschwitz. In any case, take a look at the poem. You will have seen it by now at the beginning of the If This Is a Man. And the reason for the title is uh, The Survival of Auschwitz, by the way, the English publishers thought that no one in America would know what a book called If This Is a Man is about. They wouldn't know where to shelve it on the bookshelves. And people might not be led to it. So they gave it the sort of generic title, Survival in Auschwitz, so that booksellers would know where to put it. Oh, it's in the section on the shelf. Before there was a section on the shelf. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very much. This one's Shema, and you, uh, have you had a discussion of, of the, what, you know what the Shema is? Okay. It means listen, essentially. And it's based in a passage in Deuteronomy 6, in which the words are, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Eloheinu. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? And it is part of a more complex chant, which is sung at, what is it, three out of four Orthodox services. And some went into the gas from singing the Shema. And, but Levi, and Levi is an atheist, but he writes a Shema for our generation. As you'll find from If This Be a Man, he and then subsequent book, particularly the, the one called La Trade with the Truce. Mm -hmm. He saw the events of the Shoah and the long journey home, month after month being dragged all over Northern Europe into the area of the Soviet Union before he got back home months, 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 months later after after Auschwitz was liberated, as a sort of new exodus, a new chapter in the history of his people, which needed understanding, but which could not be understood within the old theology. Because the old theology said, it's what I call the threefold if, if you do good, I will give you good. If you do not live up to covenant, then there will be disease, there will be defeat, there will be but if you return to me, I will give you prosperity again. The inevitable inference is that if you are getting evil, it's because you've done evil. And Primo Levi could not accept that. The head of one Jewish study center I know remarked, the application of covenant theology to the show is an obscenity to say that the people deserve how do you understand it then? What is this event? And so the Shema, it's a listen to the world after the show. It's a command. The tra this translation is pretty good, except in one or two characteristics where I'll ask you to change it for reasons that you will see in a moment. You who live secure in your warm houses, who return at evening to find hot food and friendly faces. Consider whether this is a man who labors in the mud, who knows no peace, who fights for a crust of bread, who dies at a yes or a no. Consider whether this is a woman without hair or name, with no more strength to remember, eyes empty and womb cold as a frog in winter. Consider, colon, this has been. And then I command 
you these words. It's not I command. I command you these words. Engrave them on your heart when you're in your house, when you walk on your way, when you go to bed, when you rise. Repeat them to your children. This is Deuteronomy 6 again. Or may your house crumble. May malady strike your feet. It, uh, take that down, if you will, and insert it for that second last line. Que la malatia vi impedisca. I'll explain why I suggest this retranslation in a moment. And may your children hide their faces from you, turn their faces from you. It is a command to the post show world, post Auschwitz world, to listen to this. This is essential to know. You will not understand this poem in all likelihood until you are finished if this is a man. Okay. For one of the challenges to communicate, how to communicate, is that language betrays. Language is based in, in social experience, you see, isn't it? And refers to social experience. I'm hungry. I missed breakfast this morning. I'm hungry. But that's not the same hunger as the hunger of Auschwitz. Being fed on a starvation diet day after day, being told to work in totally inadequate clothing in a Polish winter, thin clothing, wearing shoes, not your own shoes. Talk about the purpose then, presently. Death, it said, was the phrase in Auschwitz, begins with the shoes. What happened? You were were given shoes, not your own. Your own shoes were taken away when you went in. Then you were told to pick up somebody else's shoes from a pile. They might not fit. You put them on. No added stockings, no nothing. You go out in a Polish winter in the cold. Your feet get abscesses and sores. You're being fed soup laced heavily with salt. You get edema. Your, your feet get gangrenous. You go to the gas. Death begins with shoes. Why did they do that? To hasten death. To send them on the way to death. And as an offense. That word offense, by the way, you might want to take down and watch it through later. It becomes with them a technical term. In the last great book he wrote, The Drowned in the Save, he has a chapter in the memory of the offense. They took prayer shawls from the people who came among their belongings from the trains they were brought for those. They made underwear out of them. So dysentery ran through the camp. Why did they make their prayer shawls and underwear? to make the Jews befoul that which was associated with their religion. That is an offense. Do you follow? In an attempt to break their sense of their connection with their religion, to break their own humanity. Primo Levi saw the camps as a sort of gigantic experiment. Can you break the moral structure of human beings? Can you do it on an industrial scale? And the answer of Auschwitz is yes, you can. And the use of offense is part of that plan. How were the individual Jews identified and cataloged like merchandise? They were tattooed. But Leviticus says that Jews are not to tattoo. This is an offense. Do you, do you follow? It is part of a systematic attempt to destroy a moral and human structure. And it is there in detail after detail. 
How do I talk about these things? You see. And so when we hear Primo Levi say, you who live secure, there's another of his poems in which he talks about waiting at night for the familiar sound of iron footsteps coming to the door. Oh, one of your footsteps is going, but those footsteps are different. One of my colleagues, chair of my department when I was associate chair at one point, had me into his office, Bob Weisbach, wonderful man, Jewish by origin. And it was toward the end of the day, not unlike today. And he said to me, Ralph, you know, it's my second greatest fear. And I said, no, Bob, I don't. And he said, it's that I'll be awakened at 3 o'clock some morning with a telephone call asking me to report in the train station. Telling me to report in the train station. I said, oh, Bob. And he said, you know what my deepest fear is? Mm -hmm. That I'll go. Part of the absurdity, as Primo Levi says, looked at from an outsider's vantage point, is that some Jews turn themselves in to be in conformity with the law. That I'll go. That I'll be commanded. Do, do you follow? Do you follow? In your warm houses, you say, I'm cold. It's not the cold of Auschwitz. Language betrays. It's not the cold you feel working in thin clothing day after day at sub-zero temperature in a Polish winter. It's not the same thing. How do you say, I was cold? Who return in evening to find hot food and friendly faces. Consider whether this is a man who labors in the mud, who knows no peace, who fights for a crust of bread. Primo Levi doesn't end, if this be a man, he says he's not going to talk about the, the sort of shocking and terrible, terrible things that happen in camp. He supposes that those are known. Uh, the use of human skin for lampshades and the experiments on twins. And the women's wouldn't have known at the time Word of mouth, maybe. The women's barracks, no floor, but mud. And they were worked and fed in such a way that they got dysentery, unable to control their bowel movements. The floor got mud. The feces sank into that. They had to walk through it. They were given allowed to go to the bathroom on the whistle, get up on the whistle. If they hadn't finished, they had to get up. They got more dysentery, they went to the gaps. Primo Levi doesn't largely talk about these things. What he wants to do, because he thinks if we talk about those primarily, we will drown one another in our angers and hatreds and fears. You, you follow. And so he tries to open up You'll see it in this word, an area of conversation where we can come together and discuss what it is to be a human in the face of these events. And some of the early re uh, responses to Primo Levi in this country, particularly in the 1980s when it was being translated considerably over, how can he remain so calm, so composed in the face of such horror? They did not realize, they did not pay attention to the fact that that was Primo Levi's huge effort to find a place where we could talk with one another about what it is to be human after the show. And my sense is it cost him terribly to maintain that evenness of tone, that place where we could talk with one another. Mm -hmm. In his poems, 
you will perhaps read one called for Otto Eichmann. Do you know that name? He was the one who arranged for the transportation of the Jews to Auschwitz. He fled to South America after the war was gotten out. He was captured by the Jewish Special Services, brought back to Jerusalem, and given a trial in Jerusalem. And he writes a poem for Otto Eichmann. O oh, son of death, we did not wish you May you live five million nights, and may you hear each night the door close behind those who died, and see the air grow dark and the air filled with death. These are not the words of an unpassionate man. Deep and privileged. Sometimes at the end of chapters in the book you're reading now, you'll be moving along, and then you just fall into a depth of response, which is virtually bottomless. Let me instance for you, I don't know how many of you have read thus far, but the chapter on the selection.